Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is the Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a fantastic day. How is everybody doing? I hope you're having a, a great time today. Um, by the way, this this intro music, I made that, so uh, just in case. I don't know if I actually made that music. I, I think I put the intro together, but whatever. Uh, it's all the same thing nowadays. Um, so today I'm very excited to have a guest with me here that I was quite uh, excited about, uh, Nuria Khan, who is um, also known as Holy Humanist. Uh, he, she has her own YouTube channel that she has recently launched, which I think... Um, is very great. I shared a video in the past, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago about uh, slavery, which she made, which I found very, uh, very well done. And today uh, we finally have her here with us. Nuria, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much, AP, for calling me onto your channel. Um, I really, really appreciate it. You're definitely like a giant in this space and have been working so hard. So yeah, I'm slightly honored and maybe fangirling a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So I'm not really a giant. I'm just, you know, doing things. You're definitely, um, you're a gentle giant of the ex-Muslim movement. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that so much. Well, uh, as I said, um, it's, I really like it when uh, ex-Muslims come out and, uh, you know, speak very openly about these things and speak uh, critically and with some intellectual depth. And I found that your video on slavery was um, was very good and it was uh, really capturing the truth about uh, slavery in Islam, the, the history of slavery and what is wrong with it uh, very well. So I really appreciate that and I hope you do uh, more of that stuff in the future and I want to support you on your path right at the beginning here today with everybody here thank uh, you so much EP. thank you yeah i have a link to uh her channel to nuria's channel uh, below in the description so everybody uh please go there and subscribe to her channel she's just starting out with the channel and it's 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 very uh good so um I want to quickly say something earlier, totally unrelated, but earlier <laughs> this morning, I, saw, I, I quickly checked the stream because I wanted to make sure everything is right. And then I saw that in the live chat, there was Hamza, Hamza's den. He was in the live chat asking like, are there Christians here or something? And I thought, dude, that's really unfair because you know what? I am banned from Hamza's <laughs> chat. I, I cannot leave comments there. And he banned, he blocked me just because I asked him a few questions and because I, uh, I asked him to speak to me instead of speaking about me and he just blocked me. And now he's here in my live chat. So Hamza, what, what is this? But if you want to come here, if you want to listen, if you want to stay here, I'm sure you can benefit from it. In, if you want to have discussions, I'm sure we can also have great discussions here on my channel. You're always invited uh, to come here. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, back to you, uh, Nuria. So, um, I know I'm saying it right, but uh, Nuria Khan, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, great pronunciation. <laughs> You're okay, one okay. of the few. <laughs> okay, fantastic. That's good. That, mm -hmm. that makes me happy. Um, so, I pretty much introduced you, but is there anything that you want to add about yourself first off before we, before we get into your uh, background and your story? Um, not really, to be honest. I think you gave a pretty robust introduction. Um, yeah, I, ha I have my YouTube channel, Holy Humanist, and um, some of you may have already seen me on a couple of other channels as well. I've done a couple of interviews relaying my story, so um, I will retell it again for your audience. But yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot out there, and I'm sure we'll get into all of it. <laughs> sure. Uh, how about we start? Um, what is your background, if you want to uh, go into that? What, what is your uh, your ethnic background and your religious background? Yeah, sure. So I come from a British Pakistani family. Um, I'm the second generation to be born and bred in, in the UK. Um, but we come from a Sunni Muslim background. Um, so yeah, it's it's just standard Sunni Islam, to be honest. Um, later on, I myself and my parents kind of veered towards uh, the teachings of Sufism, but I was born into a Sunni family. So yeah, that's where it all began. <laughs> Nice, nice. I actually, um, I grew up in a in a in a uh, Sufi Muslim family, uh, so I have some familiarity with that, and I also practiced it myself for a uh, brief 
but very serious time. So mm -hmm. I, I am quite familiar with that stuff. Were you uh, at some point uh, very religious or is your experience with, with Islam more like, uh, you know, being born into it, learning more about it and then, uh, you know, leaving it? Or did you fully practice it at some point? Yeah, so basically I, just to give some like context, I was um, born in, in the UK and I lived here till I was nine. And that's where we lived as kind of an extended um, family, what a lot of kind of South Asian families live like. So it's the parents, the grandparents, even maybe your cousins and uncles, you're all kind of living together. And um, my my grandparents are very, very conservative and they hold religion um, very near and dear to them. So like from the get go, you know, when, when you're born, they whisper the azan into your ear. So then you're already certified Muslim. Um, so I was living amongst that household and from a very young age, because my grandfather was uh, very, very religious, he would kind of um, have the keys to the local mosque. He was the imam for it. So he would recite the azan there five times a day. Um, and so I would go to Quran classes every single day after school. Um, but from a young age, because I was quite close to my grandfather as well, and I saw that our relationship was just getting even better when I was taking more of an interest and in going to the mosque with him. Um, so I, I think that kind of propelled me to, to try even harder. Um, so I would I would really enjoy going to Quran classes. I'd take um, part in competitions where you, uh, obviously this is more of a male dominated arena where you kind of recite and you'll become a hafiz, but we had competitions even amongst the girls' classes. So I really tried to like memorize the, the surahs and recite them really well, even though my voice is terrible. Um, I really tried. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, at the age of seven, I was the only one in my family where I thought, okay, if, if this is the ultimate truth and I really want to go to heaven and I want to follow what God's commands are, I decided to wear hijab as well. Um, so I really started representing Islam within my community from a young age. Um, even at school, we had religious education as one of our subjects here in the UK. And I was always the, the volunteer to, to represent Islam. I demonstrated how to pray in front of the class. I was wearing hijab anyway. So I'd always talk about the lovely things that the Prophet did and how uh, killing one person is akin to ki killing all of mankind. Like I was a champion for Islam at a very young age. Um, but yeah, there was there was always some kind of you know contradictions going on in the back because I think my my parents themselves were a bit more liberal, so they weren't as ecstatic when I decided to wear hijab, and I was getting a lot of backlash with people saying you're really young if you do wear this, then taking it off becomes a lot harder, um, and I was like, what's wrong with you all? Do you not want to go to heaven? Like, why aren't you doing this if if this is what we're supposed to be doing? Um, so that was a little bit of a it, it kind of just messed with my like mind at that point, but I was so heavily set on, I want to follow God's word down to a T. Um, and even if I'm the only one doing it, I, I want to do it. And then um, ironically, I moved to Saudi Arabia and kind of the opposite happened, which we can get into if you want. But really quickly on um, just on the topic of Sufism, what really, really upset me was when I found out the truth, the dark side to Sufism as well, you know, that they would be some of the first people to kind of rally up the troops for jihad and things like that. I was, I was like, how could, I mean, again, we were sold such a, a rosy version of that. That was a die to my heart when I kind of moved away from Sunni Islam to Sufi Islam thinking I'm safe in this bubble. And then boom. <laughs> That, that is a that is a very good point. I tried to bring that up several times in the past when I talked about uh, Sufism. Like I grew up with it, I learned from it. I was part of a, uh, I became part of a Sufi sect at some point, and I knew about all the other, uh, you know, Sufi movements and their teachings and all that. And I learned about the history of it. And you know, when people tell me nowadays, especially in the West, you know, people who kind of perceive Sufism as this, uh, as this, you know, just just mysticist, peaceful, Esoteric. you know, inward thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it's not really like that <laughs> it's i mean it has some very <laughs> nice aspects like uh this whole thing like you know like getting rid of your ego and devoting yourself fully to you know to worship and all that and it, it, it is it feels very nice and very deep but as you said sufis were in history uh those who were uh very devout and who in war times would be there to immediately come out and sacrifice themselves as the you know the, the people who are who say we are ready to fight and die for allah and they would be on the front they would they, they, they would fuel this whole fire this whole uh, attitude of war and jihad and all that so it is not all peaceful they are very much you know looking forward to participate in fighting for allah that is that is really true 
<laughs> and in the meantime, they'll just do their meditative zikr and practices oh, <laughs> until, yeah. it, until it's time to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Th th that's the funny thing. Like uh, when I was part of a movement, what I learned is, okay, we should uh, – not participate in, you know, very much causing corruption and causing outrage and this and that. But when the time comes, then we will be right there. On the front know? lines. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bit hypocritical, but yeah, that's, that's just how it is. Uh, Saudi Arabia, did I get that? Did I hear that right? You yeah. you did live there? You did move there? How did that happen? Um, so we essentially moved for um, my dad's work at the time. And again, it was like, it was crazy to us. We had no idea what life would be like there. You know, you just thought of, okay, this is Islam's holy lands, but it's it's a desert in the middle of nowhere. Um, but again, for expats, the lure is like really good. It's, and you, it's considered a hardship zone and it's tax free. So they take care of everything. They'll put you in um, like a expat accommodation, which are these compounds, which is basically like almost take a little uh, suburb of America, let's say, and just place it in Saudi and build walls around it. Mm. Um, that That's what it was like to live there. But um, so yeah, we we moved there. I think I was, I was nine when I moved there and I went to a very, very international school. So as a Muslim, I think one of the biggest lures for my family was, oh my gosh, we get to live in the place where the Holy Lands are, you know, like it is um, a pillar of Islam. It, it's it's far as it's compulsory on any Muslim who can afford it to go and do this once in their lifetime. And we were just thinking, wow, we're so blessed. Like I could pop down and do Umrah on the weekend. Um, and you think some people save their entire life savings to go and do this. Um, and then the rich Muslims who can afford it just do it over and over again. So we moved to Saudi Arabia and I got, I, I was in an international school. So that's when I started interacting with people from all over the world, um, loads of different cultures, nationalities, religions, and just being part of that society in Saudi Arabia, like a couple of things started to um, play on my mind. So I did eventually, I, I, I left, I stopped wearing the hijab as when I got to Saudi Arabia because it just that the religion is so heavily enforced anyway i was like oh i don't need to prove to anyone i'm muslim here i'm mm -hmm. i'm in the home of islam like what more could you want so i had to wear a baya anyway when i when i'd go outside um you know you couldn't be seen mixing with boys in in normal places you can't really do any of those things so it felt like i was living very islamically anyway without me needing to to show it and then just speaking to so many international people, like I met some people from Lebanon and they were like from a Druze background and they would tell me that it's kind of a mis mishmash of Christianity and Islam in that terms of their practices. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, you can just chop and choose whenever, like, can I just drink a glass of wine then and adopt Christian values for the day? Like, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, and I didn't know that all of these kind of other, you know, um, versions and implementations of Islam existed and people were happy and thriving. And even the Shias in my school, um, because Saudi Arabia is like, you know, that they're, they're not very welcoming to Shia. So the, that they themselves wouldn't openly say it, but I, I guess it's quite easy with some of the surnames, you can tell who is. But just the fear I would see from my Shia friends when talking about Islam or when they were going to their own meetups, the like Shia meetups, uh, it would have to be so um like under the radar and they wouldn't want anybody to know about it so these kind of things started playing on my mind and then obviously big things like uh, when, my, when my father and my brother would come back from Jummah on a Friday they would come home but if you stayed there were just execute uh, executions taking place like they would name the name of the criminal and then amputate his hand or his foot or whatever it was and you're kind of like you're, you're just driving past and you're aware that this is being announced over the loudspeaker but so you're kind of desensitized to this and also thinking or, tr or trying to at that age anyway, I was justifying it as, in the same way my parents were thinking this is just like Wahhabism or this is like Saudi culture distorting it. This is not like Islam at all. Um, and then other things. Sorry, go on. No, I just wanted to. I, I'm just curious. Did you ever uh, watch a public execution? I didn't. No, I don't think they let women. It's just okay. it's literally in the men's section of these are more like. Um, not the bigger mosques as well, the local ones where they're happening, they just do it outside the men's section. So women aren't, even, I don't even think there's many women at those mosques because uh, they, they much prefer reading at home. You're not really encouraged to go out and pray there anyway. Mm -hmm. But there's been instances where like, obviously men who are driving down the road, um, in Riyadh especially, they would like stop them if it was prayer time because everything closes anyway, but they would say, oh, are you Muslim? Go to the mosque and pray. Um, whereas for... For, for women, it's not really like that where you would get bothered more and especially the, the Western friends that I had and um, the kind of 
people that my mom would go out with, her Western colleagues or whatever, they would get uh, harassed by the Mudawa, the Islamic police, because, um, for example, if you're in a supermarket and they're wearing an abaya but their heads, their hair's not veiled, the Mudawa would come and say, oh, like, put your put your veil on. And they would say, well, we're not Muslims. Like, we don't really believe this. But they would say, no, we don't care. Like, you're in our country, put your veil on. And in Saudi at that time, now now it's changing slightly, but in that at that time, the Mudawa is considered, like, even above the normal regular police. So you don't really put up much of a fight against them. You kind of just do what you're told. Um, so you always have to kind of be cautious of that. And then again, you're young and you're walking around a mall covered in an abaya and you're seeing like men, like old, old men, like ogling at you just because this much of your ankle is visible, you know? So, so I'm seeing all of these different sides of like repressive culture and beheadings, but I'm also in such an international environment and I'm going to Mecca on the weekends. And um, so like Islam is insanely close to my heart, but I just thought I was in some Saudi distortion of Islam. I have so many questions. <laughs> uh, did you partake in the, uh, the you, 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 you did uh, take part in the Umrah? Right? Yes. Did you many do times. the Hajj as well? Or? I didn't do the Hajj, so my, my parents did it. But um, funny story, because um, there's one of these places where you go and do Ziyarat, like you go to all the the famous Islamic like spots. There's one mosque, which is, at, I don't know if this is even real or this is just what my family told me or what source they read it from. But if you pray there, if you do like the two regard prayer there, it's equal to, um, I think it's equal to Hajj or Umrah. So when right. we got to that mosque, me and my siblings were just like, ready, set, go. <laughs> so literally I got back and yeah. like, I had done many Umrahs, but when people would say, oh, how like, have you done Hajj as well? I'm like, well, according to the prayers in that mosque, yeah. I've either done loads of Umrahs or definitely a Hajj. But yeah, no, I didn't do the Hajj. I did Umrah many times. I always find such notion very weird in Islam. It's, it's very common that uh, Muhammad says, a prayer that you do at this and this time is equal to so many years of work worship and it's like dude i mean <laughs> what what exactly is the logic of that yeah. <laughs> you can basically completely save yourself from hellfire by that logic if you just pray on one specific night but that's not really how it works is it so literally you can have a calendar marked out for yeah. like maximizing reward according yeah, to yeah, yeah 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 well, it's, it's just it's just it's, it's dumb for those who don't um who are not familiar with the terminology the hajj is the actual main pilgrimage which muslims are supposed to um supposed to undertake once in their lifetime uh at least that is that is the requirement and the umrah is uh, outside of the hajj season a uh visit similar to the pilgrimage uh similar to the hajj but it doesn't include all the programs and it's shorter right i can i forgot yeah, the details it's, it's definitely shorter it doesn't have like the you don't have to go to like arafat and all of that but right. also i think i remembered what it was as well if you do umrah the the shorter version the light version during ramadan it's equal to hajj or that's what i was told oh. <laughs> so that was like people in saudi arabia during ramadan like it is packed dude <laughs> did you um maximizing reward <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. There, there is something that um that is very rarely addressed and something that i talked about in the past and since you seem to be somebody who uh, since you are somebody who has experience with the with the local traditions and the local religious practices in the umrah and all that um i don't know how much you want to talk about this stuff but uh my parents went to the Hajj, they went to the pilgrimage, and uh, before they went, they were uh, given so many warnings about what they should do during the Hajj. And I witnessed the same thing when other people went to the Hajj, you know, they were given warnings, and there was one warning that stuck out so much, I just cannot forget it, which is, uh, which was directed at my mother and at women, it was about women in general. The warning was something like, uh, you know, that uh, women should be especially careful uh, during the Hajj, and that my father should always stay very close to my mother and never let go of her hand, uh, always make sure that she's inside, never, uh, even, I remember this one conversation about, about, about cabs, about taxis, like uh, they, were, they were saying that um, my father should go in first and uh, let her let my mother out first because uh, many things happen like, you know, m women being sexually harassed, having their belongings stolen more often, or even being abducted or something. Is that something that you uh, know of? Or? Yeah, to be honest, it's something I know a bit too, uh, too much of, which makes you really question like a lot of things. Because I've said this so many times, um, 
this amount of stories of women even if like my dad had the same fears when when we would go as a family you know so um it becomes it becomes really kind of intense and awkward and dangerous even when you're doing tawaf like when you're circumambulating the kaaba um especially like i said in ramadan times you're, it's it's like a mini hajj at that point so it's like the same amount of brush but honestly they're not afraid to pinch your bum they're not afraid to kind of touch you or kind of like you know just you're in an abaya but they use that closeness to get too close like it gets very very uncomfortable um and you're kind of in in shock at that moment because the garba's here and you're here getting touched up by some man who's in a haram and supposed to be here cleansing his soul and heart and purifying himself and you also don't feel like it's the right time to even tell the man or the person you're with your mahram because it, it it's just it, it's such a horrible thing to experience but it happens all the time um sexual harassment like that also theft you know people who leave their shoes outside the mosque they go missing and again all around you you're thinking this is a holy city this surely should be one of the safest spaces in the world um but no it, it's it's got all of the same little ugly things happening that that happen out out in the rest of Saudi Arabia as well um i know so many stories where women have come back from umrah and hajj and just had these horrible stories and they haven't even told their husbands or whoever they were with um, and then obviously, like, I, there's there's much, much darker stories, which probably will very much kill the mood of this conversation. But even one of my own teachers from high school had, like, the most horrific experience happen to her where she was in a taxi. And uh, the guy just took a detour and drove her into the middle of the desert and raped her and just left her there. Um, and she somehow, somehow, somehow made it back. But all I saw of her was she came to school to collect her belongings and she just left the country. And you can't even imagine like what would have happened. And the fact that she just silently left the country knowing there's no justice that she would ever get in Saudi Arabia. Uh, nobody would be held accountable, just speaks volumes. <laughs> I just sorry, I, I, um, AP for killing the vibe there. No, it's it, these these are things that need to be said. I mean, this this is something yeah. that even deserves its own uh, its own talk. This should be separately addressed. This is, I mean, I was a Muslim when I heard these mm -hmm. when I heard stories when I heard little mentions of these things or little warnings uh, of that kind, and I didn't even get it back then. And it was it's it's like I, I feel like until after I left Islam, I didn't even perceive what. You know, it, 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 it's just shocking back then when you are a Muslim, when you are religious and you value these things, you value, uh, you know, the Arabian lands and you value the you value the Kaaba and Mecca and Medina and all that. You think, I mean, this is Islamically described as the as a safe place, you know, where you go for refuge. And and then you think, wow, in, in that holy place, the holiest place of all, you have uh, men everywhere uh, or others everywhere trying to engage in extremely terrible behavior in, in, in abusing women and abusing others and sex in groping and rape and theft and all that. I didn't even get it back then. And only after I left Islam, I thought, wait a minute, what the hell? You know, it's... Yeah. <laughs> And and as I as I feel as I see it as I saw it back then as well, um, women don't want to tell this to their uh, partner, to their husbands, or to their families because it feels like a shame or something that nobody can do anything about anyway. So they just uh, keep it to themselves and move on, uh, or try to move on. And the authorities don't have any power to do anything because this is just so frequent, and they don't want to be they don't want to be caught up in a matter of shame. So this there's just no ending to it, and this just keeps happening. Yeah, and unfortunately, you internalize it and you think, okay, this is just a woman and this is maybe something I have to deal with, you know, and I, like, I, I never had the audacity to tell my dad just out of like, I can't even bring that to my lips, like, what would he think and say, but obviously now I, I think completely differently, but yeah, it, 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 at that point, you genuinely do think, okay, this is just something I have to deal with as a woman, but it's something I deal with alone, and because again of the, the context that's happening in you're just doubly as shocked right mm -hmm. you're like I'm here as well on a on a on a pilgrimage I'm here to get close to God and this is like the antithesis of what I should be talking yeah. about here and Absolutely. it just yeah as a woman you really internalize these things yeah we should we should definitely um 
I know I want to I want to uh, get back to this sometime. We we'll definitely talk about this more. I, I would encourage you to actually. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm on an AP. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to to talk about these these matters and to. I saw a few years back there were some uh, attempts by women who experienced similar things in Arabia, uh, attempts to bring this message out and to hold uh, the people there accountable. And there there was some. Uh, you know, some mention in the media, but then of course there's uh, there, there was this larger, much larger, much louder response from Muslims, which was like, stop mm -hmm. spreading uh, lies, stop spreading misinformation and shaming our holy place and this and that. It was just, it's just, it's just, it's just terrible. Yeah, and it's unfortunate. I think there are like, you're actually probably people who have lived in Saudi Arabia and uh, the way we were taught, because if you go to an international school, up to a certain level, Islam isn't um, compulsory. It wasn't the UAE for some reason for me, but it wasn't in Saudi, which was, I think they've just like, they had the um, pretext of a British curriculum, so they couldn't enforce it maybe. But mm -hmm. in in because of that, you have to like, obviously my parents were adamant that we would all learn the Quran. Um, so we actually had a teacher come to the house. But again, the horror stories of what these men do uh, when they come and teach kids at home is like, there's so many stories. Obviously, I'm not. We'll get back to the the point of this discussion. But yeah, all of these things definitely need to be discussed, and people, you know, they, they need to come out in the open now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody earlier made a comment about my shirt and said, uh, "Wait, oh yeah, uh, Mr. Monster said I am a kafir and I'm proud. I love the Viking shirt. By the way, the compass, a vague visor, will always lead you to lead you in the right direction." Mm -hmm. Some people ask me sometimes what this shirt is, and I never talk about it for some reason, but uh, it is indeed a symbol that is uh, associated with Nordic culture. It's uh, it's called the vague visor, which is or or vague visor, which is supposed to be. Uh, you know, leading, showing your way, showing your path, so that you can, so that you will always reach your destination. But I think it doesn't actually go back to Vikings uh, or not to the golden Viking ages. It's actually from uh, Icelandic culture or something. So, just want to, and I, and I, I, I have always liked this. That's why I'm wearing it. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. That would make such a nice tattoo as well. I was just thinking. Yeah. Yeah uh it's it's very nice I'm, I'm thinking about that too <laughs> um yeah so um boy i don't know i'm totally stuck at that thing but uh so yeah, saudi sorry, arabia guys. <laughs> no it's it, it is important to bring these things out seriously mm -hmm. I'm, I'm i'm i want to do that um after saudi arabia so you were there um how did things uh go on from then i mean um did you move from there at some point and then afterwards question your religion how did it how did the whole journey continue yeah so actually thankfully i left um saudi arabia i think when i was 16 and that was like a good time to leave because you're starting to want to learn how to drive and you do c consider things like oh going to the cinema or going to the mall in a mixed group like these normal things are just not available to you so saudi did start to feel like very very suffocating at that age and um there were like the whole time we had no cinemas, we'd always just be watching like pirated copies of movies and um, people would cross to like cross the border to go to Bahrain on the weekend just to go to the cinema. Um, so it was like a massive ordeal. And then we moved to, uh, we actually moved to Dubai. Um, and I was like, okay, this is, this is so much better now because like I can drive so I can get behind a wheel. The abaya can come off. Um, I still hear the call to prayer five times a day. I can hang out with um, and mingle with boys and nobody's going to like, there's no mudawa hovering over us, you know, um, but still all within kind of like an Islamic confine. You don't have all the liberties you would in the West. But as a Muslim, I thought this is, this is a good balance. This is maybe how it should be. Um, because again, like you are considered a Muslim, like just even by default of my name, I'd be considered a Muslim and Sharia law would always be put on me, which I realize is actually terrible and, uh, later on. But um, apart from that, I thought that they respected your personal liberties and that like they're not forcing you to wear a buyer like they were in Saudi. They're not forcing you to take um, like women only cars and stuff like that. Uh, so I moved I moved there and I was it was a perfect balance of East meets West for a long time for me. Um, and again, I just w there's people from all over the world. I went to a very international school again and I just I, I 
I was have I had much more of a liberal mindset, and this is when I started kind of looking into um, Sufi aspects of Islam more. Because while I was in Saudi, 9/11 had happened, and the war on terror had started, and Islam kind of got this really really bad rep um, around the world. And we also had had the 7/7 bombings in London, and um, one of the bombers had the same last name as me. And I remember once I was wearing like a football shirt out on the streets and it had my initial and my last name. And I got like such it like dirty looks that I was like, oh my God, this is like a real legitimate thing now. Like we're being polarized. We're being kind of um, targeted. Uh, we're being stereotyped. Like I don't think like those people at all, but just because of my name, by virtue of it, I'm lumped in with them. Uh, so all of these things started coming into my mind. And I think that's why I my parents kind of had a load of um, books on the shelf at that time about Sufism, Rumi, Shamsi Tabriz, all these kind of people. So I just started reading that and I was reading like Marcus Aurelius meditation. So I was just kind of, I was, I was trying to figure out a way in my mind where I could, because, because I couldn't justify 9-11, I couldn't justify the ideo ideology behind somebody flying planes into buildings and killing civilians, the fact that I was supposed to be part of the same ideology. So I, I think in distant, in trying to distance myself from that, I latched onto the thought of like, God is love and love is God. And, you know, a lot more of that, like, <laughs> Rumi inspired um, uh, Islamic thought. And that just made me feel better in itself, because I, I just felt like, you know, everybody has divinity within them. It was a, it was a very distorted view. But um, essentially, I went to, I, then I went to the UK for university, and I studied a, a module of Islamic law. And this is where I actually, for the first time, came across somebody who, right before we were going into one of the law lectures, um, we were introducing ourselves. And this guy came up to me, and he was like, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. But um yeah, I'm not Muslim, but I'm just here to like study this stuff. And I was like, what do you mean you're not Muslim? Because outwardly he looked like a Muslim. You know, I could tell he was back in the day or something. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, no, I just don't believe in this. And and I was like, okay, but you can be a different kind of Muslim or do something. Just don't say you're not a Muslim like that. So that was the first time I had ever come across somebody who has been a Muslim and thought, I don't like this. I can actually leave and I can check out of it. I didn't know that that was, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't know that that was a possibility. And um, so now I look back and I have these essays where I'm discussing uh, some of these Quranic ayats and some of these laws. And I am justifying, you know, like, the, the the fact that men are our caretakers and they provide for us and all of this kind of crap and I think at that because again I was so heavily indoctrinated with it and I was I was always fighting on the side of it because I, I hadn't cut off um so again I went back um with the idea now that okay Islamic law has some uh, skewed things but I justified them all to myself at the time it wasn't there weren't massive red flags um something was off but I couldn't I couldn't, I didn't know enough to break free from it. I just thought, okay, I've just done one module of Islamic law. Maybe it's a Western university who's teaching me this. Um, and maybe they've even like, you know, not got the right translations for certain things. So um, I moved back to the UAE as an adult. And then I, um, I got married a couple of years down the line. And then very quickly that kind of unraveled. And I just noticed that, wow, this, this person is not who they said they were. Um, and there were some like underlying mental health problems that weren't alerted to me. Like a lot of, there was just a lot of like, just darkness within this stuff that I wasn't aware of. So when it became like emotionally and financially abusive, and I wasn't working at the time. Um, so I was kind of like very vulnerable to begin with. But when the threat, when it got to the threat of physical violence, I was like, okay, I need to like separate myself from this situation. And um, I need to like find a job and I need to kind of get myself on, on my own two feet in case this isn't going to work out. And, you know, I need to have like a backup. So eventually, like I, I moved back to my father's house, which in Islam, he if you move from your husband to your father's house, even in Islam, it's like one wali or guardian or mahram to another. So I thought, OK, that that's completely fine. And I got a job and I started kind of getting my life back together. Um, and thinking that, okay, let's come to an amicable solution without going through the UAE courts necessary for a divorce. Um, and uh, then basic, I don't know if AP is still here. No, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm just okay, okay. Um, yeah, so then basically, before it could even come to the point where we, we could try and talk it out and settle this amicably, um, I got a call one day on the way to work from the Dubai police. And they essentially said that there has been this, 
law put on you, which in Arabic is called Ta'azawjiya, um, which relates to like disobedience on behalf of the wife. And I obviously had never heard of this. I'm still like a, you know, in my heart, I believe in Islam and I didn't know that, you know, they, this this law existed to kind of make my life hell. So I was like, sorry, I don't know, what, what do you mean? What's that, Zawjiya? And the guy basically said that we, we can arrest you and forcefully take you back to your husband's house and you're not allowed to leave without his permission. Um, sorry, sorry, where was that? This is in, in the UAE, in Dubai. Okay. Go. Um, yeah. So, so basically, and I, I might, to my like more kind of international and British human rightsy, um, I like ears. I was like, that's not possible. That's essentially holding someone against their will. That is basically like you want to hold me hostage in an environment where I'm telling you I feel safe and um, my life is potentially in danger. And I've been like literally filing and filing for harassment and stalking and all these kind of things, but they were just, um, they were just adamant. They were like, we will come and arrest you and take you back there. Um, and unless you literally file for a divorce now and give up all of your Islamic rights. So I thought, okay, that's, that's still fine. I don't really care about my Islamic rights. Like I've, I'll be fine. I've got a job and I'll cross that bridge when it comes, but if let me file for divorce. So again, I was still trusting the UAE legal system at this point, and I thought you'd just file for a divorce as you would here in the West. Um, but it turns out that before you can even do that, um, you need to go through levels of family counseling. Um, so you sit with almost like a, an Emirati, like Imam, Sheikh type figure, and he basically asks you like what's wrong in the marriage and how religious you both are and how many times a day you're praying and all of these kind of things so again i'm trying to say like you know i feel like there's an issue here with a personality disorder there's things going on that you guys don't see behind closed doors but like i've got evidence now and he and then on the flip side because the other party doesn't want a divorce right they're going to try and like drag this out and keep you trapped so he would say he would focus on things that they would understand more like oh she's um she's possessed or she's got a gin on her or that's why she wants a divorce and these men actually like entertain these concepts. They they were like, okay, why don't you guys go take two weeks, pray five times a day, and then maybe you'll have a change of heart. And you just kind of have to, it's all part of the process. So you have to be like, okay, yes, like I'll go and pray and I'll think about my relationship with God and whatever. Um, so you do that for the longest time. This is before it's even registered with the court. And um, sorry, AP, can you give me one second? I just realized my Laptop's about to die. I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. I just need to get the charger. One okay, second. Okay, okay. So sorry. No problem. Uh, this is so interesting. This is why I'm kind of just uh, not not trying not to interrupt her and just I want I want to just let her talk about this because she's obviously presenting it uh, very well. It is very interesting. Um, she has so much to say. I feel like I don't have much to add here in this situation. But what, what's very funny is um, I just I was just thinking about this yesterday because um, you know during a, during the recent debate between Daniel Hikikichu and uh, Harris Sultan, uh, the other side made it look like Islam has this um, you know this system where there is total uh, justice, where nobody is treated unjustly, and the husband is uh, you know takes care of you, and he's the he's the legal ruler over a woman, and things will then be all good and if he misbehaves then the authorities will just get into it and solve the situation but that's not really how it is i mean as nuria just um explained it and put it it's, it's not like uh if the man you know misbehaved and you can just get rid of the man or you can just have the man disciplined no the authorities in islam as i have learned it as well will try as much as possible to uh preserve the marriage and do anything for it and even if the husband is entirely abusive if it really doesn't work even if it is completely unhealthy the authorities push toward simply preserving it even if they have to blame it on disobedience on lack of religion on lack of religious uh, obligations on the woman being crazy on the woman being possessed and all that stuff so that that is really that is how it looks in reality there is no justice to it this is it is incompatible with justice it doesn't work nuria uh you were going so well your story is very interesting and um you were talking very nicely about this very thoroughly and uh, i didn't want to interrupt you um mm -hmm. if you want if you want to continue please go ahead yeah sure so um well i think i was at the point where what was I think the police had 
Where was I? <laughs> I completely forgot where I was at. So they were, uh, you were trying to divorce. They were trying to figure out whether, you know, there is, whether you are, you know. Oh, yes. And the family counseling, right? With the, yeah. Dragging, dragging out the process. Uh -huh. Right. So, uh, so I went through that whole process. And again, in between all of this, I am constantly going to uh, the police station, like very respectful as even as a Muslim woman, I would I would go in a baya, I'd be extremely respectful. And what I'm saying, because things started like ramping up then, um, he could tell that I was adamant to get a divorce. So I would literally wake up to like concoctions of like black magic potions outside my house. I would uh, be told by like my neighbors that the, there were people walking up and down, kind of like just videoing and looking into my window. Um, so things got like really, really... Um, like intense to the point of harassment and stalking and my parents were actually out of the country at the time so I went to the police on a number of occasions and I went with like my Arabic speaking friends I went with guy friends I went with anybody that they would like think okay this is you know that there's she's actually genuinely worried and I, I was like okay I am an expat in your country but surely you have like some level of duty of care towards me if I'm telling you I feel unsafe and I'm being threatened on the daily with like random delivery drivers would come to my house with threatening notes that he would have just sent um so I'd go to the police station and they would just like obviously separate me from whoever I was with and I'd be sitting there with like officer after officer and they were just like you know like one would just talk to me for 10 minutes like have him walk in his uh in his teeth and he's just like but why like why does he do this like what's the pro and I was like you guys are just not getting any of this and then this other he would just pass me on to another officer and I was just sitting there for hours at a time and I was like this is getting absolutely like ridiculous and um, it's just been a really like it's just not a not a nice experience for women and um then again, they they start they they started to like try and put so many different criminal um, charges on me just for like for to have a reason to hold me within the police station, and um, they started calling me at like 10 p.m. on the weekends, which is very out of character for Dubai police. Um, and they would just call me and say, oh, like, okay, just come to the station at 10 p.m. And I was like, why, for what purpose? And they would say, oh, well, we'll tell you when you get here. Just bring your passport and come to the station. Um, and then one of the times when it was actually so they whenever they ask you to come between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. or if they try and come to your house to take you, um, which they did once, four police officers came to my house. So I was like, OK, this is getting insane now with the kind of um, allegations they're trying to to put on me, because I know in Islam, when, when four officers come up to come to your house, what you're being framed for. And I had like a bunch of my friends over and they had the audacity to just check the IDs, take one of my friends and take him down to the police station and threaten him with like a bunch of tests. So he was like, yeah, sure, like go ahead and do what you need to do. And then they also tried to take me and make me sign a document in Arabic. And I, at that point, because I'd lived in the UAE for a long time, I did know that unless there's a female officer present, um, between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., you're under no obligation to go with the UAE police. Um, so I played that card and then I also played the card of my mehram's not here just because I had read so many horror stories um, about British expats even um, being taken down to the police station, being forced to sign a document in Arabic and then just being lost in the in the legal um, system of Dubai where they can hold you indefinitely in a in a jail cell before they even charge you. And a lot of these times these English people are like have to re resort to calling on the UK government to publicize their cases and stuff. So I was like, I am not going to be lost in their system. So I did say to the police officers when they tried to escort me to the station that if you want to take me to the station now, I need to call the British embassy and inform them why you're taking me and where you've taken me. And they obviously knew that like I was a bit clued up on my right. So they were like, okay, okay, like mafi mushkila, tomorrow, tomorrow, come down. And I was like, okay, like this is getting really, really intense now. So the next day I went during the day, um, and I with my passport in my hand and just when I got to the station I was like let me just call the embassy now and tell them the level all of these charges that they're putting on me and the status of my divorce uh just so that they're aware and I don't know the name of the person that I spoke to but I literally dialed like the emergency number for like British expats in the UAE and some angel that answered the phone he was like um I can't I told him I explained the whole situation and I said look they're trying to charge me with like theft and adultery and I'm trying to get a divorce uh they're not putting that through the courts he's stalking me her all of this stuff and he was like do you have your passport in your hand and I was like yes and he's like look I can't give you legal advice 
but I'm going to give you some serious advice. Don't go in there, drive to the airport and come home to where you have rights. And he's like, look, all I'm saying is that, you know, once you hand over your passport, they we can't interfere. It's, it's, it's a Sharia matter entirely. And we're not allowed to interfere in another country's um, judicial process. But we know that they can keep you held for however long they want like and, and we won't be able to interfere at that point so he was like come back to where you have rights come back here to where the things that they're trying to charge you with are laughable concepts here like this, this just doesn't exist and I was like okay um straight to the airport <laughs> um and I thankfully again this is why I'm saying so many women don't have the the ability to do this which is why being financially independent or pursuing some level of education or something because I had enough money in my account at that point to just literally book a flight to Baku get, because they were the police were about to put a travel ban on me if I wasn't complying um and like in Dubai as well I'm saying it's not impartial justice like my that my ex who was doing this he had tried to make friends like high up with the CID and things like that and you give them gifts and you buy them off and then even like the head of police is just working in your favor so my lawyer had told me that within two hours they're going to put a travel ban on you and then effectively like I'm held hostage in this country then I would actually like be a case where I'd need to appeal to the media and stuff which was so I I literally left in this small window and again friends who were just so aware of what was happening she the, the first flight was to Oman Muscat and one of she was so clever she was like I'm not going to book you on that flight to Muscat because you're still in GCC airspace like if you're if your Emirates ID tings at the airport because of the travel ban the Oman would still turn you in like let's fly you out so I literally got on a plane to get out of GCC airspace to Baku and then I got to Baku and I was like oh the friendliest spaces <laughs> and then I finally got to um London and yeah even then again when I got here the embassy followed up and they asked me if I was okay what had happened like where I am now so I mean I'm not I'm sure that they, they, I know that they don't handle things very well for a lot of other cases but Honestly, for my situation, they really, really, really came through for me. Man, I uh, <laughs> I didn't expect, you need I didn't a minute? expect this whole thing at all. But it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Sorry, it, it just, yeah, I've come on here like just thrown so much at you. <laughs> I know, but it's 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 good that you uh, let us out and that you share this with with us, that you shared with me and with viewers with the world this is stuff that needs to get out seriously i mean yeah we should totally uh we should totally definitely dedicate an entire thing to this you know entire an entire uh video an entire show to this where you can freely uh again i don't know how much you want to talk about this nowadays but uh, where you can again put everything down and tell your story because uh you escaped i mean you made it out you were given very good adv advice just when you needed it and you escaped you got out of there you saved yourself there are many people uh, in that situation who will not be as lucky as you are and who yeah. will be stuck who will be under constant abuse for a long time maybe for the rest of their lives maybe they're not strong enough to go through with saving themselves and they will be stuck in such a situation it will it will be it will be torture i mean how do you think how things would have gone if you had not escaped at that point oh my god sometimes i like lie awake and i was like what like you know even just one of the moves that i had made if they had been slightly different if on one of the times where i was feeling very intimidated by the police and my passport was in my pocket but i just refused to hand it over uh, there were so many instances like that and i just think that especially on the cases that I've heard and the police station and where they are out in the desert and the way that they treat women, the way that they even just treated me while I was in there just for actually trying to be like, I have a complaint for you, mate, not the other way around. Um, it, it, it's so scary. Like, obviously, I when I came here as well, that's what I'm saying. It was, it was so good. I was so traumatized. I would, I, when I came back to the UK, I literally was scared. I was scared of men. I was scared of leaving my house. I hibernated for about a year and a half. I um, Every time I heard a police siren here, I thought it was the UAE police trying to come and get me. And I ha like I, I went through, I got therapy here, which was a really, really very cool form of therapy. Um, it's kind of new, but it's called EMDR. And I'm gonna make a whole video about it because honestly, I think it was one of the best things for me because now when I try and 
um, like I just made a thumbnail recently for one of my videos on the UAE and I, I googled like the UAE Shurta, the police to get a picture and I was like oh my god I had forgotten about the, what they looked like what, but at one point in my life they were I'd get anxiety I would you know I, I'd literally think my life is over they, every knock at the door every oh it was it was a bad time but yeah and the most honestly the most demeaning part about this whole process was when you do Islamically get divorced um there's this thing where even if you give up your rights, the husband is supposed to pro provide you with maintenance, like for every month that you've left his house, which is called, I think, nafaka or something in Arabic. And the, the judgment came through for the divorce while I was in um, England. And all I was like, where I was like scrolling down to see the word divorce, because that's all I cared about. But it was like, here's your like X amount of dirhams for makeup and lipstick. And I was like, this is what you guys have ruled in this court ruling, which had so many layers, so many complaints about safety and abuse. And all you can be is, all you can care about is like, here's money for some like clothes and here's money for some lipstick. Like that's the Islamic judgment. Thank you guys. <laughs> but eventually it, it happened. You are done with it. You, you have no ties yeah. to the issue anymore, right? You're yeah, no, no, not at all, so that, that's, that's good. And I'm so sorry thing. that you went through that whole uh, process. I'm really, I'm so sorry. I mean, I, I see how that can uh, traumatize you. I, um, I am actually familiar with EMDR. I was just trying to remember uh, what it stands for. But I... Uh, Eye movement, reprocessing and desensitization. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, it's... Uh, EMDR, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, but yeah, I actually took some psychology classes, uh, including abnormal psychology, uh, treatments, therapy, and all that. So I actually learned about that and why it is special for specific cases. Yeah, it's I think very... it's for PTSD, especially, um, it, it works wonders for PTSD. I, mm -hmm. I, I was like, I had no idea about therapy, but when they recommended that I was like sure let's give it a go and obviously in the beginning you feel like a, like you're like well, am I a dog I'm just following this laser what am I doing but really when I tell you like a couple of sessions into it um, when I was extremely fearful of men and leaving my house and like the police sirens and all this the first day I went out and funnily enough even in the UK like some guy catcalled me and usually I would be quiet and just walk but I was like sorry what and I actually confronted him and I was like damn this is this is actually working it's bring, <laughs> it's honestly actually like wiped away some of the memories that are associated with that trauma um which I think is yeah it's amazing <laughs> that, that, that's that's sorry. great I, de I definitely want to talk more to you about this uh whole yeah. stuff um uh, I'm a little bit disoriented. I had so many questions about different things, and now I'm I'm totally uh, focused on that. But you wanted to say something? Um, yeah, no, actually, I was just going to say. So obviously, after eventually coming back here, and when I had gotten over, I had gotten therapy, and I had kind of made peace with, not made peace, but I was trying to make peace with what had happened from a like rational perspective, being like, okay, now I need to just check what is the Zawjia? Is where did this come from? Like, was this just men abusing their power? and um, make, trying to make my life miserable. Um, and obviously I was like, okay, the UAE legal system isn't perfect. So it clearly had loopholes to allow this kind of behavior. And again, the lawyer was a, another man who was you know, probably just running by his own methods. So I came back and when things had settled down, I really like, I was like, okay, what, what styles LG? I looked into it and it was kind of connected with um, disobedience um, for a woman in Islam. And so I Googled that and honestly, in most, um, GCC and like modern Muslim countries, it's kind of ruled out as a legal instrument, but there's still talks about it. I think maybe Egypt applies it to some level, but there's talks about, uh, there's like Egyptian papers written about what uh, the the Ta'a's al like how much of disobedience is within that. Um, so when I started reading, I was like, okay, well, clearly this has come from Sharia. And then I was like, right, where does Sharia come from? Okay, the Quran, the Islamic sources. Let me go back to that. And for the first time in my life, I was like, I, I, I didn't have um, that like that warm, rosy feeling that this book is so mystical and beautiful. And I, I automatically need to be like wowed by what it's saying. And I was like, let me see what this book says. Like, what's actually in here? Um, so I, I read it in English properly for the first time. Um, and I tried to read it a couple of times before, but I don't know, the translations I had were so enigmatic and it's not a nice read, you know, like I was really like, I was trying to read the bits about like Solomon talking to ants and 
Queen Sheba and Zulkanen. I was trying to like find history within it. And then it would just be like, disbelievers will burn in hell and like Christians are the scum of the earth. And I was like, why is God suddenly so angry? Just finish your story. Um, so it never really kept my attention back then as well. But now when I was reading it to not even from a like an emotional um, confirmation bias perspective, I was like almost examining it like legally. Um, and so straight away when I saw that like, okay, there's the, the I saw the ayat where this law was derived from, you know, like Surah Nisa as well was just giving me like so many ways where I could easily justify what happened to me. I was actually like, I'm on your guy's side. This is correct. You, you've you used this very well. It's very, very conniving, but very good because that's what the Quran allows. This is the framework it sets you up for. That's, that's literally how Sharia um, operates and then again I was like okay this is the Quran but Prophet Muhammad tr treated women so well like he was the beacon of mankind surely he wouldn't stand for this behavior like he would he would have my back and be like no you know women should be able to live um, prosperly like pro a prosperous and healthy life free from abuse so uh, lo and behold I went to look into his life um, his personal life is an absolute shambles but that's what really really shocked me so between the quran like the status of women in the quran the um the framework that unleashes child marriage um the framework that keeps women like subdued then the absolute violence the call to violence the hate speech which i just couldn't rationalize i had friends from all over the world and i was like i'm supposed to hate you if if, if i have a gay friend i know deep in my heart i'm supposed to hate you but you're such you're such a cool person. I I wouldn't want you to rot in hell. Like I'll I'd rather be in hell with you than wherever these people are, whoever these people are in heaven. Because, but I couldn't understand why God was so um, just bitter and hateful. And I had done some like outside reading as well. And obviously that whole remnants of Sufism, where I really believe something that's divine can't be violent. So the second that you're kind of cussing out disbelievers uh, who are still part of your own creation, they're just misguided. And then you, you know, even your Quran is contradictory when you say, oh, all good things come from Allah. And then it says, oh, no, ev let's, sorry, it says everything comes from Allah. And then there's another verse that says, oh, only good things com come from Allah. Bad things come from you yourself. And you're like, what, what is this God? He, he hasn't made up his own mind. He's so anyway, all of these things kind of came together um, and. I was still holding on, you know, I was like, okay, is, is this still enough reason for me to believe that um, I should let go of this altogether? Like, are there enough problems to warrant my concerns? And then I was still like, okay, well, I'm not an Arabic speaker and I don't speak Arabic natively. So I, that was the last thing I clung to. And I was like, maybe I've got this all wrong. And that's when I kind of looked into, I was like, what do native Arabic speakers say? Like, I've listened to Muslim apologists say like, you know, uh, beating means beating with a maswak and again I wasn't realizing that why are you using the same things to beat us as you're using to tame your camels and your horses like that's disgusting in itself but I wasn't thinking along those lines but then I was like okay if the Muslim apologist is telling me this let me see what an Arabic native speaker would say about the same exact word and that's when I found my outlet online and I was like oh my gosh I'm not crazy there's other people who actually think like me and um I started watching uh, Master Arab and Sharif Gaber, and I was just kind of like listening to people who would actually tell me that the apologist might be trying to deceive you and fool you at this point, because this word, even in classical Arabic, means this. Even in the Qureshi dialect, it means this. And then I was kind of getting more and more like secure in my conviction that, yeah, we've been heavily, heavily lied to. And then again, like all of you guys, you all of you YouTubers who were out there kind of saying the same things. And I was like, there are people who are saying this, who believe it, who think it, and you know, and they're brave enough to say it. And that's when, like, that's why it's so important. Because seeing all of you speak, it like, gave gave me courage and it will hopefully give other people courage. Um, but yeah, so that that's eventually how I came to be like, well, I I not just want to check out of this ideology it's so dark i actually want nothing to do with it and it's gone beyond that point now it's like we have to acknowledge that the stuff that's in these books is the root cause of so many things like that's when you asked why i'm like i'm choosing to speak out now is because i used to be one of those so-called progressive liberal Mus muslims who would think these aren't islamic problems these are all cultural problems um within within our own countries but you 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 can't you have to be 
either either covering your eyes or so wrapped up in cognitive dissonance to read some of these Islamic scriptures and think that none of these problems of like, you know, um, domestic legalized domestic abuse and child marriage and um, homophobia do not stem from there. And they're purely cultural. Like that's absolute bullshit. And it's hard to believe, right? I mean, um, what a coincidence that uh, all these Muslim cultures happen to have these uh, very horrible things in common, and uh, they yeah, all seem it's all to colonialism. be based on <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. It's not all colonialism <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, ob obviously, you take uh, Muslim cultures take many of the terrible things about uh, women's rights, about human rights in general, about the abuse of uh, minorities and the intolerance toward others from the Islamic religion itself. This is not just culture. I mean, yeah. sure, culture will uh, local cultures will eventually take certain things that they learn and will shape them in one way or another that that is, that is undeniable as part of uh, anthropology yeah. but it is also undeniable that uh, this is a common thing among it is a universal thing among Muslim cultures to develop a certain way and to develop certain attitudes that are then connected to the to, to the the foundation uh, the foundational beliefs of these cultures which are Islamic beliefs exactly precisely. Uh, yeah, so, um, sorry, I was just wanted to say something and completely lost that point, but <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you a question about uh, just, just that. But yeah, so, uh, everybody, I will be taking uh, questions and reading the super chats in just uh, a minute. Uh, we will. We are almost done. I wanted to keep this much shorter, but I never. Yeah, I'm sorry. Short. I realized uh, as well. We've gone like way over. <laughs> so, hey, it's no problem at all. It's like uh, most of the time I worry about what are we, what we are going to talk about. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, with you, it was uh, very interesting, very deep, and I definitely want to uh, have you back very soon. Definitely want to have you. Um, on again for you know another show i want to give you the platform so you can speak for yourself it's just you don't even need me here honestly <laughs> uh, yeah. it's it's the whole ex-muslim thing right it's like yeah. uh when you grow up in the muslim world and you uh you learn these islamic values these islamic teachings and you are intimidated with this uh this necessity to obey islam fully and to believe in it uh, the entire time you are um in such a state where you don't even uh, ever know of other people who also happen to grow up as Muslims and who then leave Islam, because it's not like in different uh, different cultures, not like in other more secular cultures. In Islam, because of the the fear that you are indoctrinated with, people simply stick with Islam, if even if they uh, see other things that are you know that seem to be better than Islam. So it is very hard to find that ex-Muslims are actually a thing, that people who leave Islam are actually a thing. You only find them when you look for them really hard or when you stumble upon them because you begin to question your beliefs. So it is True. indeed very important that we, those who have made that step, come out and uh, share our experience, share our knowledge and show to everyone that we are here so that we can encourage more people who are desperate and who are seeking to also make this step. Yeah, you know, ironically, like, I'm just thinking that, like, my immediate family is very chill but the rest aren't and I'm like I was trying to rationalize it to myself and I thought like you never stumble across this corner of YouTube unless you're actually uh, looking for it it's such a niche like you're either completely questioning but otherwise you're really not going to stumble up upon this so yeah it is it is definitely um driven out of people who are like you know their seeds planted or they're, they're looking for questions to be answered so hopefully then they'll, they'll be able yeah. to tolerate <laughs> Well, now, now, it's getting, now it's getting much more common. Now it's uh, so many people who otherwise wouldn't be exposed to this, who wouldn't question, are now hearing about, uh, you know, ex-Muslims are hearing about critics of Islam. And this is getting very widespread, especially over the last two years. I mean, there has been so much interaction between Muslim apologists and us that so many people who were just looking for sources to uh, reaffirm their own beliefs are now exposed to all the doubts and the criticism of Islam. And those people who you know look for sources to reaffirm their beliefs because they have because there is something that bothers them or because they want to you know they have the anxiety to become more firm in their beliefs and while they are seeking for that they might see that there is also another way a way that they were never shown yeah yeah that is great 
Um, Greg kind of said AP shout out Nuria's channel. Yes, I did it at the beginning. I want to do it again. Uh, Nuria Khan, who is with me here, has an own channel, has her own channel, which is called Holy Humanist. And uh, that channel is right down in the description. Uh, the link is right there. So if you want to uh, subscribe to her, not if you want to, please go and subscribe to her channel. It's very <laughs> nice. It's very promising. There will be a lot of uh, very important stuff uh, coming from her channel. So please go ahead and subscribe to her channel as well. It will mean a lot and you will have done some, uh, some great thing to support her and to support this cause in general. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> um, all right, De Devon Phoenix made a super chat. What do you think about the recent thing, by the way? Somebody asked that before, but I'm just going to ask that. Uh, with everything that you have experienced and with everything that you have just talked about, what do you think about the recent uh, debate between Harris Sultan and Daniel Kikichu? Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 Where do we begin with that? Um, yeah, well, it was, I mean, to be honest, I think, if, if the whole point of this, which is is just the easiest method to take with these guys, is like what Harris was saying, let them ramble and they expose themselves. Um, because, you, you know, you just can't, if you, if you actually are not like just his fanboy and cheerleading from the sides and you actually press pause and listen to his point and rationale, even a Muslim would kind of be a little bit sick in their stomach, you know, like that is what what has he actually just justified? What has he actually just like pushed forward as a as a decent narrative? Um, and I think, you know, it's just clutching at straws. They have the same kind of similar arguments to like of colonialism and this and that and why like in that time it was justified. And I mean, to be honest, I really, really respect people like you and Haris Sultan who are willing to engage with these people because um, I mean, that's a nightmare in themselves. But honestly, to, to try and, and put forward a rational argument where you're just being given red herrings, ad hominem, circular arguments, non sequiturs, it is like listening to Daniel for those four hours of the debate, I felt dumber afterwards, just like <laughs> <laughs> hearing him try and fit this piece of logic. And then you end up here and you're like, sorry, let's just go back to your very premise. Like that's that's debatable in itself. Like that that's flawed. Um, but it, it's just, uh, it, it's very rated that you guys take them on. I, uh, you know how like th th there's, everyone's got their niche in this. I'm like, I'm just going to keep just trying to drop facts and help women kind of see some of these massive flaws. But this, this turns into a, <laughs> this turns into like a massive, um, and it's almost like, it's like watching boxing intellectually on a, mm -hmm. <laughs> on a level, but you, you absolutely smashed it at the end because even your questions were like leading questions where it's like, Daniel, yes or no. And then, you know, like when he had to actually go all the way roundabout, I think you asked him um, if a woman denies her husband sex or something, um, is she, is she being disobedient or is she being cursed all night? And he literally went all the way around the fluffy. Well, in Islam, both sets of parties have rights. The male's obligation is that just say yes or no. Like it's, yeah. it's, <laughs> I find it very funny. He claims to be one of the. He claims to be uh, very honest, and he basically shames other Muslim scholars and apologists for beating around the bush and for not saying it as it is, and for you know altering their message to uh, you know uh, to to please the West or things like that, whatever he wants to call it. So he wants to be the guy who is open and very honest about it. But then he has a problem answering such very simple questions because he knows the outcome of those questions. Like uh, one of those questions was, uh, do you prefer democracy do we prefer sharia over uh, secularism if you had the power would you turn america into a an islamic country and what would happen to those who resist and he answered that question basically by saying well uh you know islam is a great religion and you know there are many ways to invite people to islam and i sincerely invite everybody to islam and this and that and he never even answered the question it's like yeah yeah that's just, what they're masters of. And that I can see why that gets so draining after a while, you know? Yeah. It really does. And he does this like he distracts from the topic so much that you that uh 
to you know to somebody who is uh who who likes him it may look like he has actually answered the question or he's actually said something but then in the, if you look at it critically he has completely avoided the point of the point of the question and completely talked around it yeah. uh, or or you know or he he does this thing all the time you ask him a question about islam and then he immediately gets to, i mean every answer that he gave during the debate involves well secularism of the west is so bad so evil so terrible look what the colonialists have done dude that's not that's not the topic i think that's it all point. i know and even like you know some of these keywords i think it was human rights extremists was the first time when i was like shoot myself second one was co-wife i was like oh my god someone yeah. kill me now co-wife is yeah. part of this perfect familial setup that he thinks sharia safeguards and um i also think it was it was it, it's hard like i know Hara sultan got a lot of stick for not answering every single thing that he says but in that format it's very hard and what you just described is one of their tactics of deflection so mm -hmm. all of his cheerleaders will think that he's answered the question but if you actually like the way you're making these videos now honestly ap it's perfect because there's the there's the question and then there's his like ramble and you can see in that there's no question answered but what he does say is disgusting yeah I even fell for it personally. I have to be very honest. You know, I had him on for a conversation on my channel. And my initial purpose, as I also told him, was to simply invite him and to ask him questions and to dig into his thoughts, you know, just to let him talk for himself what he believes in. And when I had him on, he completely deflected so many times by just appealing to, you know, the terrible colonialists and the West and this and that. And honestly, I fell for it because I wasn't yeah. familiar with his tactic. I fell yeah. for it and I started arguing with him about the West and about colonialism. And only later I realized, wait a minute, what the hell? He actually got me. That was not yeah. even the point. I was supposed to talk about his beliefs. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, I think that that's exactly what happens. But once we start realizing this is the tactic in itself, you can just constantly be like, that's not the point. That's that's actually di diverting this conversation. And even um, in, even in his debate with, with Harris, it did kind of, it was, it was weird. It wasn't sticky. The whole four hours wasn't related to Sharia versus human rights. There was mm -hmm. so many things thrown in. He showed his Pikachu at one point, like you know, it's just uh, I mean, it's, it's it's comical at some level. And but. this whole generalization, um, basically, I mean, he went into the whole uh, the debate with the premise that uh, since Harris Sultan supports human rights, that means he also supports Western liberalism and Western liberal history in general, including uh, genocides that occurred due to the West or you know colonialism, brutal displacements, and this and that. Uh, and and even capital punishment when Harris Sultan doesn't even believe in capital punishment. Yeah. So the whole premise is entirely flawed. But and see, in, in that setting, when it is set up like that, you can't you can't even sort out those issues from the beginning to be like, listen, these aren't even all the things I agree with. So you painting me with that general paintbrush and then your fans cheering isn't going to help any anybody because yeah. at the end of the day, a debate is meant to be intellectual discussion, right? And it's whoever's won or lost isn't it's not it's not who's kind of beaten their chest that much it's like how many minds were actually changed from what you're saying you've got your daniel has his crowd which are just going to be loyal to him till their, their death but mm. um th there's these things that need to be cleared up from the beginning because you can't actually intellectually level with someone or come up with good counters or actually offer solutions when the initial premise is wrong so the mm. whole premise with these guys is wrong to begin with their whole Con their whole concept of the, of what our worldviews are, and they think that's all a monolith as well. Just because we we perpetuate human, we you know propagate human rights, that we're all the exact same, and you can put all of those things on us. Like we agree with capital punishment and the Western version of or what America's foreign policy is. That's not the case. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he makes it look like uh, you know he has this Islamic religion with very clear tenets and very clear teachings that cannot be changed and not be contradicted. He has his prophets and his texts and all that, and he treats it like humanism or, or human rights or liberalism or whatever you want to call it is like that. If you agree with one part, you must agree with all other parts. It's just yeah. it's just ludicrous. I exactly. I, I think <laughs> It is. it is honestly a bit of just misguided uh kind of like revenge towards the west mm -hmm. and and all of that so there's so many factors at play, unfortunately but, yeah. unfortunately yeah. Okay, let's get into uh, Super Chats. Let's read some questions. I want to read questions. If you have questions, please add them. Uh, I will look into all of them. I'm losing my screen here. Just a second. Just give me a minute. Um, all right. This was a very nice show. I really want to have you back on sometime. I think... Um, 
everybody here liked it as well especially yeah, sure. it's been yeah. really enjoyable um yeah. so thank you guys so far yeah. it's been it's, it's really nice talking to you ap actually thank you i appreciate it there are also so many muslims here i think they are enjoying it as well there are many of them here exceptionally a uh, high number of muslim viewers so i really appreciate it very much dear muslim viewers dear muslim listeners thank you for being here and i hope uh this is beneficial to you <laughs> so do i thank you for being here and listening to what we yeah. have to say yeah they really like you um <laughs> okay let's see <laughs> All right, uh, let's look at the super chats here. We have uh, Mr. Monster said, I am a kafir. Is this big enough? Can can this be read? Uh, Mr. Monster said, I'm a kafir and proud. I love the Viking shirt, but oh, I read that earlier. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Mm -hmm. Monster. I appreciate it. Uh, Ramon CGTC said, why is Islam extreme? Is it something cultural? I think we very much talked about that uh, earlier. We touched upon that. Uh, Nuria brought it up, the whole excuse that it is cultural. Uh, but it's you, you can summarize it if you want to, <laughs> if you want to add anything to it. But. Yeah, no, I, I just think of the, the very like as, as we discussed as well. But the very foundations of Islam is like totalitarian in nature, and that's why it has the propensity to be extreme very easily. If you want to take the like literalist interpretation, if you're a Salafi, it's a lot easier to be extreme. If you want to um, like like if you want to identify with your religion. Um, and show it as well and maximize that you can also lean towards being extreme if you are missing a void in your life if you're looking for something to cling to that can also I mean Islam definitely just lays the foundations for a totalitarian ideology it controls your finances your your marital life your your dress code your thoughts your what you do five times a day like, like you know it's, it's it's just in every part of the ideology is inherently totalitarian which makes it extreme in itself Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree with that assessment. Akhtar Ali said AP is the last messenger. I agree. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Monster made a super chat and said, I'm curious, how do you guys feel about the stampedes that happened during the Hajj? A couple of years ago, I saw a video about a stampede happening in uh, Mecca. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I when I when I would hear about them, I was like, oh my god! But you know, when you're a Muslim and you think these people died in Mecca and maybe they wanted that they would be happy that they died in Mecca and they also get like a special burial if you do die there and you get like it's considered uh, like you get the prayer of the sh the Imam from Mecca reading your like your your funeral prayer which is considered mm -hmm. huge and you're going straight to paradise so when i was a muslim i would think oh that's insane what happened but maybe these people got the best that they could possibly ask for and they died happy which I, even if it was painful and horrible um but yeah it just also showed that like well obviously like now when i see it i think once my grandparents were there as well that the a bridge collapsed right when they almost got entrance and that's when I genuinely was like what the hell like why is this happening in in God's house these people are there to to go and like come back in one piece why is that happening in a situation like that but again there's so many parts and practices within the Hajj that are just a I'm sorry outright stupid and b um really really dangerous it's mm -hmm. it's the stampedes that occur which are completely unavoidable like if you were just to have um just, just the, even the setup could be done so much better. But even the pop, pop, the sorry, the point where you throw stones at the devil, um, people who are in the back, right at the back when they're doing that and throwing stones, aren't reaching those pillars. You're literally stoning the head. You're hitting the heads of all the people before you. And Hajj shouldn't have to entail such a level of danger. Like when my parents went to do Hajj. Um, I'm the eldest sibling, so I was extremely scared because obviously my siblings were in my care, but my parents had written a will, like if anything had happened to them at Hajj, um, because th these are things to think about when you're even just doing tawaf, circumambulating the Kaaba during Hajj, that's dangerous. Then the stampedes that happen is extremely dangerous. Once you fall over, there's a rule when you go to Mecca is um, if your shoe falls off or whatever, never, ever, if anything drops, never bend down to pick it up because you were guaranteed to be yeah. crushed. And that yeah. was like, you know how your dad had a set of rules, like th this was something we were told as well, never look down, never pick it up and don't I stop remember walking. Um, so yeah, it's crazy. I remember that, I remember that. Yeah, uh, I was actually given the chance once to go to the to the no to the to Umrah with uh, with 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 my employer back then who offered it to me. 
but yeah. at that, at that bonus, point, AP. <laughs> no, he actually wasn't wrong with me. <laughs> he was a terrible person, but uh, mm -hmm. I guess he wanted to do something good for uh, people, and you know, he mm -hmm. believes in Islam, and he thinks, oh, that is something good if I just buy, uh, you know, Umrah you for know what several people. He probably people. thinks as well he's going to get rewarded that you've. Yeah, he sent yeah. you to do it. It's yeah, so, yeah, oh yeah. god, it's so self-serving. I feel like I should have gone because I feel like right now I feel I, I think man, I should have had that experience at least once. As much as I, uh, you know, dislike it now, but at that point I had already uh, freshly, newly left Islam, so I I was like, ah, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. You know what's um, it's crazy is when you are driving towards it and. Like as you're going, there's like a bridge with a Quran on it, and then it goes Muslims this way, and all non-Muslims this way. And every time we drive past that bit, I would be like, "That is so discriminatory." But you feel like you're part of this. You are a part of this exclusive cult, but you genuinely feel it when you're taking that right turn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All you, all you bad people, go the other way. Don't come here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Russell Cohen made a super chat. Thank you so much, Russell. Said, thank you both for speaking about your experiences. What you have to say is very important. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Russell, thank you so much. We appreciate it very, very much. Greg Kanowitz made a super chat and said, one talking point on Islam is that the marriages are everlasting and better than Western ones. But I would say this law explains why that is the case. Yeah, that was in reference earlier to uh, you describing your experience with the law about disobedience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. They're, they are considered more everlasting because of how difficult it is to get divorced Islamically. And then not just like legally, but uh, obviously societally as well, like the taboos and, you know, all the reasons that women would uh, be considered, like would consider staying in the marriage, I mean, whether it's for children or family pressure or fear of being labeled a divorcee. But yeah, Islam does not help. It doesn't give women the right to divorce. Um, countries have adopted it in the form of khullah and stuff, but the Quran gives a unilateral divorce to men. Otherwise, I yeah, don't think yeah. they'd be everlasting. Not that they are, they're not even everlasting. But yeah, divorce rates would be a lot, lot higher. Yeah, if, if you keep something that is broken, if you keep it by force, instead of replacing it or throwing it away, that doesn't mean uh, it is better because it lasts longer. That just means you're keeping something that is broken instead of uh, doing the reasonable thing, which is to replace it or to get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jianju said in a super chat, thank you so much. What does Nuria think of Daniel Pikachu? We just talked about this very much. <laughs> Uh, do you want to add anything to it, or should we? Uh, go ahead? I, don't, I think we've 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 covered it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But thank you so much, Andrew. I, I, I think you. it was actually your super chat that reminded me of asking this question. So thank you so much. Uh, Greg Kanowitz said everything was razor thin in this story. So close. Yeah. It's, and I want to hear more of that. I want to hear you tell the story uh, again. And yeah, people need to hear this. Uh, Greg Kanovic said, Nuria is a strong woman. Love her story and videos. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Greg. Always makes a lot of super gents here. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Kanovic said again, what part of Prophet's life shocked her? Oh, yeah. What, what, is, what was exceptionally shocking to you about Muhammad? Well, Greg, can I just say, what part of his life didn't shock me? <laughs> Let's just frame it that way. Um, but no, it was honestly like his marriages... Um, and stories where, you know, when he advised people to go and drink the camel urine and then they kind of betrayed him and then he uh, branded their eyes with eye, he ordered their eyes to be branded with iron and like extremely violent things when he ordered his um, son to take this lady, Um Girfa, and snap her legs between two camels. I just felt sick. I couldn't believe that this was the same man who we've told his sweat smells like roses. Um, again, pff, the fact that he married a six-year-old, consummated it at nine, I was absolutely, I was appalled. Um, and yeah, just everything, the, the fact that he led over 90 military campaigns, I, I stopped seeing him as this rosy character and his own issues with his wives, his, um, his uh, like the fact that he even struck Aisha on her chest once, that really bothered me. Um, the fact that the prophet himself did that. It wasn't even like his companions or anyone, but like him himself. Um, but yeah, a lot of things. And then clearly like the, the words he said, so likening us to chattel and dogs and saying that we're, we're the women's of the creatures that appear and reappear in the, in the form of a devil and we're deficient in intelligence and we're deficient in religion and we're blah, blah, blah. Let's go. He's just like, he's 
it's so easy for a woman to be like, you're a despicable human being when it comes to caring for half of humanity. Um, yeah, yeah. And you've not safeguarded our rights. You've snatched them away. But yeah, every everything basically, um, a lot of it was like, even the, the the genocide he committed against the Banu Kureza, and then, you know, like marrying a woman after you've slaughtered her brother and her father and every member of her tribe and telling your own companions not to like pull out when they're having sexual intercourse with sex slaves because every soul is free. Uh, it's just, uh, what didn't? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny that uh, you, you, you mentioned that one thing where uh, Mohammed says that uh, the women advance and retire in the shape of the devil. That's what he says. And uh, the story behind this, I talked about this many times, uh, is that Muhammad is outside walking while he's married to, while he has several wives already, and he sees a woman outside, and he has irresistible thoughts, and immediately rushes home to one of his wives, Zainab, and has sex with her there, like on the spot, I don't know. <laughs> as the story goes. And, and while she's busy, she's tanning leather and, and he just uh you know goes and has sex with her and then goes outside and says oh women come in the shape of a devil you know so if you see a woman outside go to your wife and i i, I don't know i think about this and i think that's not normal behavior you know I, he's normal. supposed to be he's supposed to be this this uh you know example to us this admirable prophet who has this you know this mental strength that nobody that none of us has but that is not normal behavior so apparently it's he has penile behavior. strength that nobody has <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. That's guess one so. thing he does have. <laughs> and that is and that is too overwhelming for his brain, I guess. That's how it, how it moves. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's too, that's very strange. I mean, you learn your entire life that Muhammad is this exemplary, wonderful character, and then you see that story. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Timothy Bance said in a super chat, when you left your ex-husband, did your family and friends victim blame you and tell you to go back? Um, so actually, no, as I was mentioning, thankfully, um, when I, when I even got the, um, the order of Dar al Jia put on me, I, like I said, the first place I went back to was my parents and I just was like, guys, right. There's no way they can do this. Like surely. And they were in agreement with me and they were like, yeah, there's no way that anyone or any judge or we're sending you back to that household. Um, so they were very, very supportive. Obviously, um, they figured out the, the reality of the situation and, um, I didn't receive any backlash for them from them directly. And again, like I said, my friends were the ones who, you know, one of them was uh, like aware enough to realize let's get you beyond uh, the GCC airspace. Let's kind of get you into a safe zone. And uh, like I said, they had escorted me to the police station. They'd helped me through my whole process. I think when people realize it's just a bad marriage or it's a it's 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 really taking its toll on someone's mental health um because I think they saw I became like a shadow of my former self and that was probably very apparent to them apparently I was uh, my friend said for three months like I just kind of wasn't in touch with them and I, I don't really remember that I think I was just thinking whether I should stay or not in this marriage so if anything um it was more me thinking oh my god I've messed up because you know when you when you think you're getting married you think it's going to last forever and mm -hmm. especially coming from a like Pakistani background divorce is still considered quite taboo and it's like the last last resort and you kind of don't want that label but it, so I was worried about all of that which is the reason I stayed longer than I even should have it wasn't even that long it, 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 it fell apart within within two years and half of that time I kept running away back to my parents in Malaysia and then moved in with them in Dubai so um, but it definitely did the taboo and my own insecurities of like, oh my God, I, I've had a failed marriage and what is this, what, what, what does this mean for my life? And I'm going to be a divorcee and blah, blah, blah. That kind of all stopped me um, from speaking out earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get that pretty much what I expected, to be honest. Um, thank you for that. And thank you. Uh, who was that? Timothy Benz for that super chat. Greg Kanowitz said again, um, AP shout out Nuria's channel. Oh yeah, that's what I read earlier and did so. I want to do it again. Uh, the link to her channel is right down below in the description. Please go and subscribe. Uh, and help spread the word. Uh, Devon made a super chat and didn't say anything. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hakan Ur Chalishgan, a Turkish name, made a super chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Nathaniel Robinson made a super chat and said, have you compared notes with women who have left other religions? Is there abuse that is common to all and specific to Islam? Yeah, interesting um, question. Yeah, very interesting question, actually. Thank you for that. Um, 
So yeah, in terms of uh, comparing notes with women from other religions, I haven't done that specifically yet. I've kind of just been more exposed to women who have left Islam, just because I also know more about it and I can relate to that experience a bit more. But I, I'm very aware of the fact that religions are um, kind of misogynistic across the board and obviously always to the detriment of women's liberties and women's rights. So I, um, I'm i not going to be surprised if women have suffered. I know that obviously in certain ones like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and stuff, there's a lot of similar uh suffocating aspects to islam uh but I, I i'm definitely i've already got stuff um in the works to collaborate with other ex-muslim women so we can get their stories and the common talking points out but um eventually yeah i will also reach out to women from across the board because um even if our even if our struggle was slightly different the the kind of bigger picture is exactly the same so yeah that's very interesting and i and i will kind of hopefully be able to do that soon that's fantastic that's great to hear skull knight said it's over 9000 i believe that refers to the the, <laughs> the sexual strength of muhammad in oh bloody hell wow what is this man mixed mixed with a reference of what is it is it from dragon ball or something i think it's one of, one of, one of those animes uh <laughs> that was good um okay there's one more super chat here stop scamming man said the smithsonian's put a video video on their youtube channel uh what these mysterious girls tell us about women in petra it's about documents showing a pre-islamic nabataean woman was a business owner oh is that supposed to be in correlation with or is it Okay, I, I kind of see two things here that might be implied, which is one is that women were just much better before Islam. Mm, that's what I got as well. <laughs> yeah, and the other is that it, that this might have some connection to claims that the origins of Islam were actually uh, moved from Petra to Mecca or something like that. Uh, but a very interesting, interesting uh, information. I'll make to make sure to check it out. Um, what what is very funny is uh, I I read one of these books very long ago from um, one of the travelers I don't remember his name who travels who traveled the world he's very so popular. Is it Ibn but it's different um, the status of women in different cultures very much and. Uh, which, which is just a very brief mention, to be honest. He describes more uh, other things that he sees in the society. But he um, he travels to the lands of the, you know, where, where the Turkic people live, I think, where Turkic people live. And he basically says that uh, the women there are, seem to have, seem to have very much uh, more rights. And they are, they have more say than Muslims in the Arab world. And they resemble the women of the, the, the West or of the Christians, you know, the Kufar or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, references like these are so much, uh, so abundant in old sources where when people come nowadays, these uh, modern Muslim apologists nowadays come and say, Islam gave women, Islam treated women much better than all other religions. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Man? Look at your own history. Look at your own scriptures. Look at your own yeah. historical Even Phanesia was like, at least she was a business um, owner or a trader. Like, what were Muhammad's wives after that? None yeah. of them were yeah. as rich yeah. or... Their, their life well. was basically done. They had to yeah. get married to Muhammad, and then that's the end of their life. They cannot that's get married it. anymore. They cannot have any other role in society. Basically, be confined to the house. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Speak to men behind the cloth. All yeah. Of that. yeah, yeah, as they should because they are women. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to you, Nuria. This was a very interesting conversation. I hope we can do that again in the future. Um, we yeah, will do that sure. really soon. Thank and you so much, AP, once again. And thank you to everybody listening. Hope it was informative and enjoyable. <laughs> oh, it was, it was. Sorry for the buzzkills in the middle. <laughs> it was needed. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming here. And uh, always happy to host you and always happy to support you. Again, as said uh, several times, Nuria Khan, has a YouTube channel called Holy Humanist. It is right down in the description. Please go and subscribe. And uh, also don't forget to like this stream before you leave and hit the notification bell. I've never said that before, but please do it. Everybody says it, so I want to say it too. Uh, and for all of those who don't like this stream and who don't like my channel, please make sure to dislike this stream and to also <clears throat> share it on all platforms by saying, I really dislike this video. Uh, <laughs> Clever. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, oh, here, another final super chat, but this is it. Okay. Uh, Stop scamming man said the narrative when Muslims doubt is often poor thing. Shaitan is whispering in their ear. They ascribe full agency and no excuse when people leave, however. I think the Petra revisionism is nonsense, by the way. Yeah, yeah, agree on both accounts. I think the Petra revisionism is not very good. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, Muslims have this attitude in general that. Uh, it is just doubts and whispers. Oh my god, how often I heard that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's that's really it's really bothering. And that, that is based on several um Quran verses and also on a on a hadith, which is one that I I find very significant and never forget, which is uh a hadith in which Muhammad says, The devil comes to some of you and asks you questions like who created this and who created that until he asks who created Allah. If he uh whispers to you like this, uh, seek refuge in Allah and let go of such empty thoughts. That's basically what he says. So what he tells you is, Hey, dude, if you have doubts, shut up, don't question, pray to Allah and let go of thinking such stupid things. That's what he basically says. Instead of actually, you know, responding to the point, and then it is left to, uh, <laughs> to to aspiring Muslim philosophers to <laughs> give all the answers that Muhammad could not give and to make arguments. You know, it's funny. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for the support. Thanks for listening. Thanks for all the comments and the super chats and all that. I will see you again. I will. This weekend have a scholar on here to talk about some uh, matters regarding the historicity of the Kaaba. Uh, will be very interesting. As I, I gave my opinions at my refutations of the whole thing already, but I am just a guy and people want to look up to a certain scholar who is familiar with biblical history and who is familiar with Near Eastern studies. So um, I contacted a few people and I have somebody who will be here with me to analyze specific claims about Islam and the Kaaba and what the history of the Near East actually is. Uh, I'm not sure if I will do it live. I will probably record it and then afterwards uh, publish it. It will be a big blow to the whole uh, Islamic narrative that has been going around recently. Um, oh, I can't wait. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. And there will be even more. I'm planning some really good stuff in that direction. All right. Um, thanks so much, everybody. As, as said again, uh, thank you, Nuria and uh, Nuria and everybody. Have a fantastic day and stay away from Islam. Do you want to say it too? You can say it too if you want to. Stay away from Islam. I don't say it as good as you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was very it's good. Your thing. I need to come up with a thing. Yours is so good. Oh, stay away you. from Islam. <laughs> and, and that's it. <laughs>